so you're all aware, recording has started. Great, we'll give folks just another minute and then we'll, um, we'll commence. Great. Um, well, it is 6.02, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, it sounds like someone that just joined, there's a little bit of background noise. So um, unless you have questions, if you wouldn't mind uh, muting yourselves, that would be fantastic. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is our second public meeting regarding the Valley Parkway improvements. Um, I'm Christina Lane. I'm the transportation planner here at the county. Um, we also have Yelena on in with us. She's a transportation oper operations and planning supervisor. Um, so yeah, we're just going to go over um, high level recap of our last meeting, what the project scope is, um, and then get into addressing some of the concerns and data that we've collected so far um, and data we still are in the process of collecting and just kind of give you guys an update of where we're at. So uh, this is the same slide I presented to you guys a couple months ago um, or several months ago now. So the Valley Parkway overlay project um, is of uh, strictly repaving of uh, Valley Parkway from, from Valley Road to Ken Carroll Avenue. Um, as an overlay project, we consider this a routine maintenance projects that occur throughout the, the county and are based off of a pavement condition index that our road and bridge, uh, our road and bridge department determines. Uh, so this roadway has been cited for overlay. It was um, anticipated to be overlaid this year, but uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to get community feedback, um, see in what ways we can address your concerns at the neighborhood level. Um, it's important to note that that as a maintenance project, this is consistent from curb to curb. Uh, so minimal concrete work generally occurs on these types of projects, um, but uh, it's strictly more so, you know, overlay, crossings, and, and operations based. Um, it's important to note that out, uh, concerns outside of Valley Parkway will not be addressed with this project. Um, but if you do have concerns on those roadways, um, you can always send a send request to our division directly. Uh, so Gillian is actually going to go over some of the the um, a lot of a lot of the concerns that we received um, were frankly were financially constrained, and so Gillian wants to touch on some of the county budget aspect. Thank you, Christina. Um, so just, just to reiterate that for the overlay project, you know, it's a mill and overlay. We take off a layer of asphalt, and we put down a new layer of asphalt. So that fixes a lot of, you know, um, problems that you might see with, with, with the pavement in the roadway. Um, and then we do also do what's called repair and replace of concrete um, that's within the public right of way. And so that's where, you know, some of the sidewalk curbs, um, what's existing and in public right of way, if it's not compliant with um, current ADA standards, then that those portions are replaced and or repaired. Um, so that could include sidewalk slabs, you know, slabs, uh, curb ramps, um, pans that are in the right of way uh, within this project area. Now, some of the questions we've gotten is, well, what are we going to be able to do? And part of the reason of reaching out to this group is, you know, over the last several years, we've received complaints from various residents or concerns about from various residents. And we wanted to bring everybody together to talk through some of the issues as a group and what we can and can't do as a county during certain projects. 
Now, during mill and overlay projects, you know, that we do restripe roads that were striped previously. Whoever's not muted, please mute. So we can we can put down new striping. So that is an option that's a low cost option um, during mill and overlay projects. And we can change striping. So that's why we're part of this meeting is meeting ahead to find out if we need to change any of the striping or add striping on this roadway. We are also taking concerns about um, additional safety projects. And that gets into where we have the county budget. Um, these roadway projects are funded through the Road and Bridge Fund and it's primarily made up of the Highway User Tax Fund, aka the gas tax. Um, sorry, Elaine, I'm going to interrupt you in a second. Uh, anybody that's unmuted, if you wouldn't mind muting yourselves, it's um, a little hard to hear, hear you, Elena. Looks like Tim Burgess. I'm is... muting you. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, Thank you. So the road and bridge fund is primarily made up of highway user tax fund, which is the gas tax and property taxes with smaller contributions from other sources like vehicle ownership taxes for a total budget of approximately $40 million a year. Um, I know that sounds like a big number, but when you are dealing with 29, like almost 3000 lane miles of roads, um, and then that also includes um, all of the culverts and bridges and signals and signal maintenance. Um, every aspect of the infrastructure that is our transportation network all comes out of that $40 million budget. All the capital projects that we deal with um, you know, for improving for capacity issues. And then there's a very small number, $350,000 out of that $40 million budget that is set aside for specifically for safety projects. Safety projects include enhanced crosswalks, um, pedestrian flashers like rectangular rapid flashing beacons, um, crossing tables, guardrail, um, any number of smaller safety um, infrastructure or um, engineering projects that we can put together to improve, um, to reduce crash potential on our roadways. So, some of these projects that come out of, you know, some of the concerns we discussed during this meeting could could be put into that bucket of safety projects, which is why they're important to mention during this meeting, but they might not be able to be resolved with the mill and overlay specifically. But we are going to be doing analysis and doing the work we need to do to determine whether it qualifies for a safety improvement project. And then it gets ranked with other projects throughout the whole county to determine basically when funding becomes available, the next ranked project gets, gets installed. Um, we also have traffic impact fees. Um, there's a north, south and evergreen areas. Those also called the TIF, you may have heard of that. This, these are fees we get from developers um, when they come into the county and they con contribute basically to the traffic impact from increased development in the county. That list of projects that are funded through the TIF is updated every five years. Um, and then there's also the sale, Southeast sales tax, um, which this neighborhood is in that boundary. Um, and those also, when that sales tax was implemented, identified specific projects um, that those taxes were going to pay for. And then another way we get funding is through grants that we apply for um, to try to supplement the county's uh, budget. The outlook is a little grim right now. Um, approximately, we have approximately a 300 plus million dollar shortfall for maintenance and repair of existing infrastructure um, in the next 10 years. So that means we're going to be short 300 million dollars in the next 10 years um, to to keep what we already have into what we consider good condition, good operating condition. So we're we're going to be struggling um, to determine, you know, where we put prioritize putting the funding that we do have um, when we have a deteriorating infrastructure because cost of infrastructure and maintenance and repair and replacement just keeps going up. Um, and then we are also still Tabor limited in this county, um, which I'm not a Tabor expert, um, but basically it caps what we can collect and um, it limits the county's ability to raise taxes. So I just, I wanted to put that out there that, you know, Funding and, and, and budget is is a tough thing. We have to deal with it because we don't have a lot of money to do a lot of um, what we'd like to do, but we do want to know what we need to do so we can at least 
know about it, prioritize it, get it on um, ranked project lists so that eventually they can be put on the ground. Okay. And I'll bring it back to Christina. All right, thanks, Elena. <clears throat> So uh, on that note, we'll get into some of the uh, the responses we received from our interactive engagement map. So um, as many of you contributed to that, thank you so much. Um, we we had that open for about five weeks um, and received about 38 individual comments. Um, we're unable to tell how many of those are individual respond, uh, responders, but um, the comments that came through, the common themes are um, definitely the request for rectangular rapid flashing beacons um, or the pedestrian activated flashers that you see in locations throughout the county. Um, speeding has been uh, a main concern that's been uh, brought to our attention even greater in the last several weeks. Uh, stop sign compliance has been another uh, major concern for the neighborhood. Um, and then drainage. And while drainage, uh, for, for the purposes of what we'll be discussing today, um, that's less so on, on the transportation operations side, but that's been marked for road and bridge. So um, again, as Elena mentioned, uh, with some of the concrete work that does occur during these maintenance projects, um, any of those concerns will be addressed during that time uh, road and bridge will road and bridge tackles the, the concrete side of things. So it's also important for us to reiterate what's um, what is and isn't in the scope of this project. So again, as a maintenance project, um, you know, we're, we're re relatively limited in what we actually complete during these. Uh, so, we one request that we did receive um, was for traffic circles at several intersections along Valley Parkway. Um, and this is not to say that we are not uh, proponents of traffic circles, but uh, currently the county does not have a traffic common policy and therefore we're unable to implement this type of infrastructure without understanding uh, having something in place that determines when and where this type of treatment would be installed. Um, so this kind of goes in line in line with, you know, as Yelena mentioned, with the our budgetary constraints, um, things ultimately we go by a warrant system where uh, things have to be warranted for us to justify the cost of investing in that infrastructure. Um, so without that policy in place, without us understanding that the the treatment um, benefits and the the locations that make sense to install traffic circles, um, we're unable to do that at this time. Um, we got some requests for re reduction of crossing widths. Um, so again, this does require some more extensive concrete work to bring those curbs into the roadway. Uh, but at the location that we did get these requests, we will be analyzing that crossing data um, for adding to our safety improvement, Im safety improvement project list, which Yelena mentioned is that 350,000 budget that we have every year. Um, and as Yelena also mentioned, it ultimately gets ranked. So there's certain criteria that would have to meet to even be added to the list um, to begin with. But then at that time, it's ranked against all safety projects that we've identified identified across the, the county. Um, there was a request to detach sidewalks in your intersection. So um, as you're all aware, the majority of sidewalks in the neighborhood are um, along Valley Parkway are detached um, until you start to approach the intersections. Uh, again, this would require pretty extensive concrete work and um, there's the, the concern was regarding safety and plowing. Um, we do not maintain plowing of sidewalks. So if the plowing is a concern, then that's um, an HOA uh, a concern to, to bring to their attention. Uh, but the there's also nothing that necessarily suggests that detaching the sidewalk um, creates a safer environment. It might feel more comfortable and it might feel safer. Uh, but ultimately, we would we we don't practice tearing out um, you know good infrastructure to implement additional infrastructure. Uh, there was also a request to add sidewalks on side streets. So at the county right now, we are in the process of conducting a sidewalk gap analysis. And in that sidewalk gap analysis, um, again, based off of our budgetary constraints, we are not looking at local roadway sidewalks at all right now um, to be included in that priority, that priority ranking. We have at least 100 miles of sidewalk gap along our major, I mean, our major collectors and higher. Um, ultimately, those are always going to rank higher than us implementing uh, sidewalks on local roadways. Um, but on that note, if the HOA is installed, is interested in installing additional um, sidewalks, then then we're happy to work through that process with the HOA. There were a few concerns that came to us regarding the trail network. So some of the soft surface trails um, and hard surface trails, some of the paths that go through the neighborhood. 
um, one specifically regarding some social trails. Uh, so again, this is outside of our scope, but I we have been in touch with um, the HOA trails team and have forwarded all those concerns to them for their own um, their own review. There's another request for replacing the existing pedestrian signals um, with rectangular rapid flashing beacons uh, for aesthetics per aesthetic purposes. Um, we would eventually look at installing rectangular rapid flashing beacons if they are warranted um, and only at the time that the signals become uh, whether they're structurally compromised or no longer functioning um, then that would be the time that we would remove those and then at that point we would analyze whether or not rectangular rapid flashing beacons would be warranted and then lastly um, there was a, a request to restrict bicyclists entirely from the roadway um, this is a actually a state policy, not only just a county policy, but a state policy that bicyclists have a right to our roadways. There are very few roadways within the state, um, predominantly freeways, uh, that restrict bicyclists, and this is not a policy that we are willing to entertain changing. So there was a question in the chat. I'm just going to uh, direct oh, it now. Of great. what is what does detaching a sidewalk mean? Um, and a detached sidewalk is one that has a, a tree lawn or some other landscaping or just literally a gap between the sidewalk and the curb head. And so the opposite of that is an ad attached sidewalk, which um, is the sidewalk is actually touching the curb. You're welcome. Great, thank you, Elena. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, um, We've, we haven't collected quite the amount of data that we were hoping to in preparation for this meeting. Um, one thing that we have co completed is the speed data. Um, so we'll, we'll predominantly be discussing that to this, the rest of the evening. Um, data to be collected still uh, are our intersection approaches, um, really looking at identifying um, the, the lack of compliance with some of those four-way stops. Um, we plan on collecting comprehensive traffic data, so um, that'll include daily and turning movements at some of the intersections identified uh, based off of your concerns. Uh, crash data, we do have the crash data for this corridor, but the county is actually conducting a, uh, a countywide safety study that um, is dives a little bit deeper into understanding crash patterns and actual treatments that help mitigate those crash patterns. So we're going to wait till that comes out and then uh, have so we have a better idea if there's any consistent crash patterns that that our consultant is noticing on this roadway. Um, if there's any gaps in their study, then we'll do a deeper dive ourselves. But um, that's the reason that we won't be addressing the crash data today. We're going to wait for that study to come out, which comes out in November. Um, and then lastly, uh, pedestrian counts. So uh, we've been working with the trails team very closely the last couple of weeks, and they'll be putting out um, some, some counters for us and assisting with um, collecting better data for pedestrian counts. And ultimately this will assist us in determining where um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons are warranted. Um, so again, you know, it, it kind of aligns with like uh, I mentioned before with our uh, the, with the traffic circles. Um, everything has to come down to what's warranted, um, and we have standards that are that are set to determine those. So that data will um, will help us tremendously. So to hop into some of the speed study findings, um, we collected speed studies. Uh, we did speed studies at three different locations. Um, one of the locations was, was at, I think it's Bannon Gearhart Park, um, the parking lot there. The data came back a little wonky. It doesn't look like it was capturing all of our southbound travelers, so we're going to recollect that data. Um, so I only have two locations to, set, to share with you today, uh, one of them being this location between White Oak Drive, um, well, both White Oaks, um, and then so White Oak and Club, though, is the, the opposite cross street. Um, so the average daily traffic volumes are 2,778. Uh, that aligns with a with a collector roadway, um, which is what the classification of, of Valley Parkway is. The average speed we found was 36 miles per hour, so right in line with the posted speed limit. The 85th percentile um, is 40 miles per hour. So um, I, I was in, I was corresponding with several residents about what the 85th percentile means. And ultimately, it's a it's a designation that the it's what the Federal Highway Administration has determined is the appropriate speed based off of the way the vast majority of motorists are perceiving the speed limit to be set um, based off of the design. So at an 85th percentile at 40 miles per hour, it's within that, you know, kind of five mile per hour threshold of enforcement. Um, and and so we we view this as a 
as a good sign that people are complying with the, the posted speed limit. But it's also important to note that, you know, your concerns are real and that there are some that are few, but there are people that are excessively speeding. The max speed that we caught through here was 86 miles per hour. Um, but to highlight, you know, more so the, the lack of extensive speeding, um, you know, we would look at it more so if, you know, say, 30-ish percent of people were 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 in this these ranges, then we would be more concerned. Uh, so 45 to 49 miles per hour is only about 2.1 percent of of uh, daily traffic. So about 59 cars per day. And then those exceeding 50 miles per hour, where you're getting to that kind of egregious speeding, um, is about 2.25 percent, or about seven cars a day. So. It's not to say that you know there isn't speeding on the roadway, uh, but it does say that this is this is a harder concern to address because the majority of people are the design of the roadway is truly aligning with the way people are predominantly traveling. Um, at our other location that we had was just south of Tamarid, so this is where we put um, we wanted to collect data as several residents expressed concerns with the uh, if you're headed northbound the merge of two lanes into one lane at this location is kind of where that speeding starts to get pretty excessive. So we conduct accounts, we conducted a speed study here as well. Um, traffic volumes are slightly lower, um, we assume likely because of the access to the school in White Oak. So volumes decrease slightly. Um, the average speed is only 32 miles per hour. The 85th percentile is 37 miles an hour. So again, um, really aligning with the, the design speed of this roadway and the posted speed limit. But the max speed again is 63 miles per hour. Um, those that are that are going 45 to 49 miles per hour is only about 2% of vehicles per day, or only 10 cars a day. And then 50 miles per hour plus is 0.6% of motorists um, or about three cars per day. So with that, that's actually all we have to share with you on the data that we've collected. Like I mentioned, um, you know, we'll have this compiled in the, the coming weeks. Um, and then at that point, our plan will be to uh, start mocking up some uh, potential design solutions, and then we'll bring this back to the community and address some of these data collections and then some of our, our proposed design solutions as well. Um, so on that, uh, I'm happy, we're happy to answer any questions that you all might have. If any, <laughs> uh, I see some hands raising. So I saw first, um, let's see here. I saw Lindsay here. Okay. I'm switching gears here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we okay. can. Um, I was wondering if you have done any um, kind of partnering with other agencies like Safe Routes to, to School. Um, or any of those kind of groups to look at the pedestrian angle of, um, you know, their recommendations and, and are we um, set up to be meeting those standards um, on that main stretch? Because as I'm sure you know, the, the two schools are right there um, and just wanting to make sure that, you know, we're looking at this not just like as a traffic issue, but as also a pedestrian issue. Yeah, great question. Um, absolutely, we are we are really trying to look at this predominantly from um, a pedestrian standpoint, just because that's the main concern of the residents. So that's why we'll, we will be conducting a lot of, um, with the assistance of the trails team, collecting a lot of pedestrian data. Um, as it relates to Safe Routes to School, so Safe Routes to School kind of plays two different roles. Um, they provide grants for infrastructure, and then they provide uh, grants for uh, more planning, programming, education. Um, so in a location like this where the sidewalk network is pretty pretty complete, um, especially on you know one side of the road and looking at some of those additional crossings, uh, there would unlikely be an opportunity to go after grant funds. Um, this would rank very lowly on the at the state level for um, access concerns. Uh, for crossings, um, that's ultimately what you know what we're looking at more closely, which is why we're collecting those pedestrian count data, especially at crossings, to see what is warranted for greater enhancements to create um, uh, to potentially create a safer environment if it's warranted. Lindsay, I'm going to add to that and just something you said there. Um, so, Safe Routes to School does not provide consulting. 
Um, it is it is a grants program, a federally and federal dollars administered through the state. And then in, um, in order to receive those dollars, basically communities, jurisdictions apply for funding and they have to prove that they have an issue that warrants that funding. So correct. It, it's not a group that we can um, consult with to get opinions on the pedestrian issues in the neighborhood. It's it's a program to provide funding once an issues have been identified. I guess the um, I wasn't clear in, in my delivery. Um, I'm thinking in terms of like the recommendations that they make. Um, so I um, helped coordinate the um, uh, walking and wheeling week for Bradford last year. And so I worked with them a fair amount, but they have a, a survey that they hand out to the parents and they, you know, say like, how safe do you feel like your intersections are? Are there any sticking points? Things like that. It's just an informal survey kind of thing. Um, but my thought was that maybe they had or someone else like the, you know, national transportation safety, whatever, um, has some kind of standard that says like, this is, these are the top five things we want to look for in, um, you know, like that we want to see for pedestrian usage or we want to see for, you know, a route to school or things like that. I guess that's what I'm saying is like a rubric or some kind of way to say this is, um, this is what should be here at a minimum. Does that make sense? Yes, and Elena, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe that there is any standard rubric from Safe Routes to School on what they um, expect for accessibility to a school. Um, how how I've worked with Safe Routes to School before is actually initiated by um, either, you know, concerned parents, the school, or actually the jurisdiction. So, um, you know, based off of the concerns that, that we might receive, we'll look into applying for a Safe Routes to School grant um, and identifying those things. But my experience has been the, the background on recommendations and everything is actually consulted, is actually um, proposed and designed by the agency itself. Um, there are, I know, opportunities that where, say, a parent decides to go after a Safe, safe Routes to School grant, um, then they can, they can hire a consultant. Um, but my experience has been internally, we're the ones designing and coming up with the, the predominant solutions. So really what we're doing here is trying to address some of those at the, with this corridor. And Elena, your experiences I know have might have been different with Safe Routes to School. It's, that's about covers it. Lindsay, there's um I mean each jurisdiction has its own standards for trans like transportation design standards, has land development regulations, uh dictating what infrastructure looks like within those jurisdictional boundaries. Um that is true for unincorporated Jefferson County. We have a transportation design and construction manual which dictates the standards of at which roads are built, which includes pedestrian infrastructure and bicycle infrastructure, um, depending on the template, which is where you are in the county versus you know rural or more plains areas so we typically we follow our templates and then the county also has policies around where certain infrastructure can be installed christina mentioned at the beginning of the presentation um you know a, that we don't the only traffic calming policy that we have is the speed hump policy um so an identified need um, that it seems like this neighborhood is 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 stating is that there is a need for more tools in the traffic calming toolbox. Does that get to your questions about standards and pedestrian crossings? Yeah, route? yeah and I, I'm really interested in, in kind of seeing the solutions that you guys come up with for sure. And I, I do want to say I really do appreciate all of the work you're putting into making sure that you're getting input from us and and trying to incorporate it. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, okay, Philip had his hand up, but I don't see it yes. anymore. Yes, oh. it's it's still up. Okay, it's great. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm looking at several screens here, so right. <laughs> thank you. I, I mean, I don't know if it's still up, but I still want to speak, if I may. I really great presentation, very interesting data. Uh, especially that you've got about 95% of motorists complying with the speed limit. How that guy got up to 86 miles an hour is beyond me. I've never got anywhere close to that. Um, but anyway, here's, here's the piece of information. Um, the breaches of the, or the disregard for stop signs. 
Don't find it too bad at the four ways, possibly because it's a four way, but it's the side roads, in particular going from north to south um, between Long Spur and the school, Dawn Heath, Barbary and Mahonia, all on the east side. You can ha you could have a, 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 a Jefferson County Sheriff's Station there every morning between about 6.30 and 7.30, and they'd probably make their quota for the month in giving tickets. I, I would say about 25% of people never stop at those stop signs and just come straight out as though they're living in France, where it's priority à droite. Um, south, going further south, um, um, the Amaranth Drive South Connector and the Buckthorn Drive South Connector, both of which are on the inside of curves. So very bad design originally. Goodness knows why that was ever approved. But um, traffic comes out of those a lot. And maybe it's because they haven't looked or they're a little slow on the uptake. But you, you'll often see um, cars not disregarding the stop signs, but pulling out um, in front of traffic because of the limited sight visibility. And then the other one in that area where the guy was going 86 miles an hour, the White Oak Drive South, um, a lot of cars seem to just come down that hill and merge straight right into the right hand lane, possibly because it's two lanes wide and they think that most people are going to turn left at South Valley Parkway. But those are just my observations on the non-compliance with stop signs. My Thank question you. for you, sorry, do you, do you do you have something no, to say? let's go. Go ahead. Sorry, I thought your pause. I thought you had done, and so I was going to thank you for your comments. And then, but keep going. Well, that, that was my piece of information. I'm, I'm begging. I'm taking my full three minutes, if I may. The question is on regular routine maintenance and street sweeping, and I am a very big proponent on the more frequently you sweep a street, the tidier it looks, the less inviting to vandals it looks. We've had a lot of vandalism in the va valley, and it's increasing. And I, I think that along with the broken window theory that Rudy Giuliani practiced in New York, if we make the thing look tidy, it helps um, stop people's um, desire to, to make things look worse. But also that we've got a mutual um, interest here where this would be beneficial for both bikers and car drivers, because if the gutters are full of stones and chips and rocks and sand and pine cones, it's very difficult for the bikers to want to cycle in that. So they're going to be out in the traffic um, lanes, uh, a danger to themselves and a nuisance to car drivers, but fully understandable because they don't want to be cycling uh, on gravel. But also if there's rock chips and so on and cars are throwing those up, you've got um, a chance of damage shattering to your windshield. And uh, this is more of a problem on C470, which is out of your jurisdiction, but the number of the number of windshields that are replaced in Colorado is way above the national average. So I just wondered how often do you schedule that road to be swept? Uh, we don't have the answer to that. Um, that would have, we would have to consult with Road and Bridge to find, find out. Find out. Oh, oh, hold on. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, look, I'm sorry. I'm looking for whoever doesn't have their mute on so I can stop the echo, but it looks like it took care of itself. Um, so that's a road and bridge question, and we, we could certainly supply that information um, uh, at our follow-up meeting um, on how frequently they do street sweeping. I actually I have no idea. I do know which we will mention, because why not? <laughs> so we're, we're short almost 30 plow drivers for this winter. Um, so the snow clearing routes are gonna be significantly reduced this oh, winter. Um, okay. It's a statewide problem. Uh, CDOT's short about 150 plow drivers for this winter. And um, despite our best efforts to get folks hired, um, uh, we aren't. We just aren't finding the workers. It, it takes a lot of training, and it's it's a dangerous job if you're not well qualified to drive right. those very large trucks. Um, uh -huh. So that will be significantly reduced. And then also, we do have Commander Daly with us, um, and I would like him to maybe talk to you. You, you mentioned two things, Philip, about stationing um, a, a patrol. Right. I, um, I didn't. No, I didn't notice the gentleman there. <laughs> yes. Um, but then <laughs> also. <laughs> Maybe another um, um, urban myth of, of quotas. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, regarding the, the Q word, that actually uh, we don't have quotas. Um, 
So uh, <laughs> when, it, when there's any concern like that uh, regarding running stop signs, speeding and that kind of stuff, um, those concerns can always be presented to the sheriff's office on our website. And there's, there's a link on there where uh, any concerns, complaints, whatever uh, can be put on there. They come in through our uh, public information office and then they get uh, basically filed and, and sent to the appropriate unit. Um, so all this would go to our traffic unit and then um, it would be determined you know, location. Um, we would put it out to our district cars and to our traffic unit uh, and determine how we could best uh, go and both observe and also enforce uh, any, any traffic concerns. Um, but uh, so uh, two parts to that. Uh, as soon as we show up, folks tend to, uh, to be more like, especially in these residential areas, tend to be much more um, uh, adherence to the, to the traffic laws and stuff. Um, now, if you're out on, you know, major roadways and that kind of stuff, and then, yeah, you're, you're less likely to see us because you're just moving faster. Um, and then uh, what I wanted to, I wrote it down here is vandalism in the valley with a question mark. Um, you said that, that we've got an increase in vandalism in that area. Um, this is the first I'm hearing of it. So my first question is, is it being reported to us? Um, because I haven't seen, so I, I look at my, uh, at our reports uh, that come in to us every single day that I work Sunday through Wednesday, and then my partner commander Wednesday through Saturday, he looks at it. Um, I, I, I really can't say that I see much of any uh, reports that come in from, from your neighborhood. Um, so I would only suggest that if it's seen, if it's determined, then um, you can either call the non-emergency number or put it in through, uh, through the website um, so that uh, we can respond and deal with it. Okay, that, that's very helpful. We've actually got Victoria, our general manager, on this conference call, and okay. uh, she could probably address that question. I know that the first point of reporting it is to our open space department, and in general, they are the ones who go out and clean the graffiti off the rocks, or in okay. the last couple of weeks, we've had um, obscene comments spray painted on some of the sidewalks. Whether they then report to you, I, I do not know. And and I can give you the I can tell you that answer and it is rare it is pretty much no. Um, it's only deal with it. We only report it. Sorry, we only report it if it's uh, larger amounts on like some of the main roadways. If there's smaller amounts of graffiti, like within one of our open space areas, we wouldn't report that. But there was one larger incident, like I think it was somewhere within the North Ranch last year, and we report things like that that are larger. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So parks and rec, open space. Um, it's pretty much understood that they're just going to go uh, and do all mitigation, clean up, and get it taken care of. Um, and so yeah, we we then we typically don't get the report because what what it would be is we would take a report, we would start tracking it, but we would ultimately send it to those entities for uh, for mitigation, for cleanup, and and such. And Philip, the same is true within public right away. If um, you know, there's reports of graffiti on traffic control signs. Um, typically, that's reported to our sign shop or at Road and Bridge, and they come out and they clean up. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Very helpful. You're welcome. Um, next is Philip. Um, good to move on to the next hand that's up. I think so. Okay, that would be Tim Berg up next. And then Deb, your comments are in the chat, so I'll speak your comments once we get through the hands. Hi, this is uh, Tim. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, um, so my observation is, um, you know, I, I did hear some of the comments you guys made. Um, so for example, if you're coming off of 470 and you get off on Ken Carroll Avenue, um, that intersection right there, there's no merge lane. Um, I've had several, I, I've actually had three people that were coming to, to our house since we've lived here that have been rear-ended uh, there on that exit ramp. 
Um, and there's been, I don't know how many accidents, but quite a few. And in one incident, somebody came off that entrance ramp and actually hit the Ken Carroll um, Valley sign and knocked it over. And I, I think they were going like 60 miles an hour. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it's all the details. Um, and then you come to the next intersection, which is uh, Ken Carroll Avenue and South Valley Road. And um, as you go east on that, every single time it rains or there's a little bit of snow or there's some bad weather conditions, somebody runs into the median and knocks the road sign over. I mean, I would say it's, it's almost like 100% that that sign gets knocked down every single time it snows. And to me, what it looks like is the, it's an off camber turn, meaning you're, you're turning left but the road uh, slopes to the right. So I think that's why people keep running into that sign there and knocking it over. Um, and then up by the horse stables, as you come to the next intersection, the, I live in North Ranch, so you go past the manor house. Um, there's, a, there's a stop sign on the left, but really the stop sign should be on the right. You know, like you, you should always, the, the, the traffic coming in from the right should be yielding to the traffic on the left. And, and there it's kind of the stop sign is reversed. And my mom, who actually also lives in the neighborhood, she's in her 80s, that intersection so bad, she actually hurt her neck. Um, and she couldn't, she literally couldn't leave the house for several days because uh, she hurt her neck so badly. Um, there's been, as far as I know, there's been three fatalities in the neighborhood since we've lived here in, in 10 years. Um, there's been several cars on the side of the road that have been totaled uh, in the middle of the night by speeding cars. Um, one of the particularly bad sections for speeding is right in front of the manor house, like from Dakota Lodge going north. Uh, the road gets wide and people just pick up a ridiculous amount of speed right there. Um, I've actually been passed on the right. Um, you know, I've been in my lane going to speed limit and somebody's gone around me on the shoulder at probably 80, 90 miles an hour. And I know that's happened to many other people. And, um, you know, I, I think the speed, like once you get past Dakota Lodge and you get into the stop signs, I don't think the speed is so much of a a problem after that but between 470 and Dakota Lodge speeding is definitely an issue and then right in front of the manor house on North Ranch Road speeding is a huge problem um, to echo Phillips comments uh, running stop signs is epidemic I mean it's you know where I live if you go to the stop sign on the corner any time of day 90% of the cars don't stop for the stop signs um, you know, to, also to echo Phillips comments on vandalism, uh, there was a car stolen out of the driveway, uh, right in front of my house. I want to say just a few months ago, uh, there's been several cars that have been broken into in their driveways. I believe there was at least two or three other cars that were stolen out of driveways. So, um, you know, there is definitely an uptick in uh, things like that, you know, so it's not just spray paint and graffiti. It's also, you know, I think stealing a car out of somebody's driveway is a little bit more more serious than that. Right. So um, let me um, let me make a quick comment to that. That's this is I mean, this is off comment for off topic from from the overlayment project. But um, just to let you know that nationwide, um, property crime, specifically speaking to cars, has gone up by 38 uh, percent. We are our county uh, and the cities within the county are falling right in line with that. Um, you, despite all of our efforts um, in what we do is we, we call it mission oriented shifts. So we see where cars are being uh, either trespassed, broken into and stuff state, taken out of them or vehicle thefts. Uh, and then we go and we, we push into those areas and basically just start trying to catch as many people as we can. Um, what we end up doing um, is kind of a whack-a-mole kind of uh, 
outcome where we'll get them, we might be able to push them into Lakewood, but then Lakewood ends up pushing them back out to us. Um, so we see those reports every day and on a weekly basis, we, we remove, we reallocate where our deputies are gonna go and proactively work. Um, so that is something that has been recognized. We had gone in there, uh, we've gone in there uh, periodically when, uh, you know, as we expect, either, either expect or have seen start, start to tick up, um, we've gotten in there. Um, now you may not see us because uh, we're typically at night and then we're also not going out with, you know, our lights on and being really obvious that we're there because we're trying to catch bad guys. So we're, we're going out there, you know, driving quietly and um, sometimes even uh, just going and parking in a shadowy area so we can just see the traffic that's moving and that kind of thing. So just to that, um, we are doing our best to address that um, and then I'll, I'll cease from that so we can get back on topic, sorry. Sure, no problem. And thank you for the, that uh, information. So, you know, I guess my concern is, is when we do the road work, you know, I wanna see some improvements to, to safety. You know, I don't wanna just pave the road and then be done with it. And I was actually the one that put some of those comments about the traffic circles in there. Um, there is a traffic circle on Bellevue, right up by Home Depot. Uh, there's another one, I go to Home Depot a lot. So <laughs> uh, there's another one at the other Home Depot uh, over by Grant Ranch. So, you know, I think there is a precedent for, and then there's several in Golden, uh, actually right by the, the sheriff's office. Um, I forget what the name of the road is right there, but, you know, so I did some research on that and it, it, it shows that, you know, the, the fatalities and accidents are reduced. It's, it's 70%, you know, so, you know, to me, if we can save one fatality, if we can save one accident, it's worth it, you know, so uh, that's my perspective on that. Right, and I just want to clarify that Christina wasn't stating that roundabouts, which is all the what you just mentioned, are all roundabouts, um, are is a facility that the county does consider when we are improving or considering, um, you know, locations where have warrant signals, and occasionally where locations have enough traffic to warrant always stops. Um, we are considering roundabouts because of those things you just mentioned. Um, there is an improvement in um, severe crashes. Um, if there are crashes at those types of facilities, they are typically property damage only. Um, and they are typically uh, have fewer severe um, injuries for pedestrians and bicyclists in them as well. Um, she was specifically mentioning like traffic circles, um, which sounds like sem um, semantics, but they are actually different. Um, in that uh, for neighborhood traffic calming using a facility that it doesn't require rebuilding an entire intersection potentially having to acquire right-of-way um, where you can you can install traffic circles um, in the space that's already there um, that is the type of facility that we don't have a policy for at this time sure. yes so they're, the they're essentially extremely they're much smaller with like essentially just a center concrete barrier that creates the same motion as a roundabout but they're much smaller in nature so they it, like Elena said it doesn't require that we you know acquire right of way um to create an entire roundabout feature a traffic circle is much smaller in scale okay so the area i'm you know particularly interested is right in front of dakota lodge you know because that's kind of where you go from being on a, on more of an open road to now being in the neighborhood so I, that's where I was thinking, you know, a traffic circle would, would really make a lot of sense because it would, you know, A, it doesn't, there's no traffic light, so it doesn't use electricity. Um, it offloads the sheriff, in my opinion, because instead of sitting there watching people running stop signs, you know, they can be dealing with more serious issues. And, you know, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a long-term solution. It's not just mm -hmm. a quick fix, you know, but it's something that's really going to last. And then the other place I was thinking it would make a lot of sense is at um, South Valley and uh, Valley Park. So like down by the parking lot, uh, South Valley Park, you know, that intersection right there. I think that would make a, you know, I don't know who owns the land and, and, and what, what all is involved there, but I think that would make a perfect 
place also for you know a traffic circle or I don't roundabout <laughs> I don't I don't know the difference but to me it's a it's a visual impact you know you come along and you hit this you see this traffic circle and you say oh now I'm coming into a residential neighborhood you know it, it changes the way people think about the road they're on you know to me it it helps the sheriff you know uh, uh, calling the sheriff every time you see somebody run a stop sign I don't think is beneficial to anybody. So, you know, I think, you know, that's where traffic engineering and, and actually, you know, designing the road to address traffic problems would, would really be helpful. Uh, we agree with most of what you said, Tim. Um, and if we had all the money in the world, we would absolutely be getting this schedule for construction and all the, the thumbs up for hopefully at least the majority of residents in the neighborhood. Um, so it is something we are going to we are going to be collecting um, additional traffic counts at at least the v South Valley Road um, Valley Parkway intersection. Um, we're also collecting counts at Ken Carroll Valley. Um, we do have some good news. I'm going to share my screen. I love it when you at least ask for one thing we can say is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you what you're looking at right now is an bear with me because I realize most of you probably are not looking at roadway plans on a regular basis. So I'll try to describe this the best I can. But these are the CDOT, the Colorado Department of Transportation plans for the intersection of Ken Carroll. And this is the off ramp from C470. So Tim, that the concern that they're not being a merge lane will no longer be a concern next summer. Um, Because they are going to go ahead and put in a merge lane here. This is what this graphic here is showing. Um, and then they're going to be doing some other improvements at this intersection as well. Um, some some slip lane improvements, some crossing improvements. Um, this is a raised crossing table here, so that slows traffic down. Um, separating some of the bicycle and um, pedestrian traffic where we have the C470 bikeway. Um, improving some of the curb and gutter, some of the turn lanes. So there's there's some improvements that will be happening at that intersection, including your merge lane that you asked for. Um, they are also going to, so this is the end of the merge lane going uh, west on Ken Carroll. Um, and then they are going to also be putting in wildlife fencing um, along all the way to the intersection of uh, South Valley Parkway and Ken Carroll. Um, so that will hopefully reduce some of the um, animals being hit by motorists. Great. Um, can I ask what the what what is the budget for the the Valley Parkway? Um, you know, I don't I don't know what this project is called, but the the project we're talking about is there a certain budget, or is that still under discussion? Or? Still under discussion. So we are not, I don't actually know the numbers for what Road and Bridge, like the number of tons of asphalt that they have planned for the mill and overlay for this. Um, and uh, basically they, they, they get a concrete contract um, for annual con concrete work. And they basically just work and, is, until they can, you know, they spend the money that they have. Um, they get as much concrete work done. So basically what the, the repair and replace that's going to happen on this segment of roadway uh, is going to be in the contract. Where we have some leeway here is if we need to stay um, based on pedestrian routes, if there's curb ramps that exist in one location now, if it might be better to have them in a different location in the future. So basically one for one replacement. Um, anything beyond what is existing or repair and replace of existing in the mill and overlay, um, then we are going to be pulling that out of our safety funds. And so smaller projects, it's like paint or, you know, uh, we already are scheduled to put in some, um, some crosswalk markings, um, at a location where the, the HOA paid for some curb ramps just north of, uh, Don Heath trail or uh, Don Heath Drive, just north of there. Um, we, we will be planning for those improvements and then based on warrants we'll, and then looking at the safety improvement project list, if any of those projects rise to the top, then we will budget for those to get those installed and we'll try to um, coordinate that as close as possible to these other roadway improvements going on. 
we can't prioritize safety improvements in this neighborhood just because there's a mill and overlay going on because there's going to be a mill and overlay going on all over the county and believe it or not every neighborhood has concerns sure thank you so and then you know the the comment about cyclists you know that that one kind of uh, that, that hurts me <laughs> uh, personally um you know there was a little boy on a bike that was killed you know that you guys probably know about that you know not very long ago. And I just, you know, I just think as a county and, you know, as a neighborhood, you know, it's the opposite. We need to respect cyclists. We need to put in bike lanes. We need to encourage bike riding. You know, I, I, um, I don't understand why somebody would want to ban uh, bikes. You know, that's, that's pretty unfortunate in my opinion. We encourage you to participate in the bike plan um, update, which is going on right now, and you know provide your comments. We also provide, you know, encourage folks who believe that bicycles should not be in roadways to comment as well. Um, as staff, we we try to uh, try to meet in the middle and accommodate as many desires as we can, um, but we do try to meet uh, you know nationwide best practices, um, which is why we have a bike plan update going on right now. So um, you can definitely go to our website. If you type in jeffco.us bike plan, you should get to the right spot. Um, Tim, I am going to go ahead and move on to the next Thank person you. just because I'm done. Respective Thank time. You. Thanks, Tim. Thank um, Brian? Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Brian Zweibel here. Thanks very much, Yelena and Christina. Sounds like actually one, uh, I was just going to make two suggestions. I found out about this meeting after the July meeting. I watched a bit of the replay. So, and I had missed the, the geolocation survey deal that you guys had going on. So I uh, wasn't able to participate, but you just mentioned a crosswalk or like paint being added north of, uh, it sounds like north of Don Heath. And that's a trail, uh, the trail ties in as a T right there uh, to the sidewalk. So I thought, I've always thought that would be a great place for a, a painted crosswalk. So sounds like that's been added. I want to make sure that, that that was known to you guys. I think that'd be a great improvement. Um, so wonderful. And then the other one was drainage like uh, in the roadway between the White Oaks. Um, so I think it's just south of club the club drive in White Oak in the left lane. There's always been or well, I haven't lived in the valley for uh, about five years, but uh, I still pass through there often and if I recall from last winter and VA4 that you guys, there's a lot of water pooling in the left lane, um, just so that the so the left lane, which would be the you know of the southbound lanes, um, just south of the White Oak Club Oak intersection, and so that's just a drainage problem there. And I don't know what I'm not a road engineer, uh, so no idea how to fix that, but thought I'd draw your attention to it. Because I would imagine the road degrades faster there, or whatever kind of problems you know you guys probably don't want to deal with on a recurring basis. <laughs> Maybe able to deal with it during the mill and overlay. So I wanted to mention that. And if you've got any questions about my description or if I was unclear, I'm happy to. I, I can picture it, and I'm looking at Google Maps, but I may not have spoken clear enough. So let me know. No, that's great, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, several actually addressed um, in the interactive map drainage of the concern. So uh, those locations seem to be mostly accurate and where people have posted those, but um, we will be noting that to our road and bridge team since they'll be doing all the concrete work associated with the roadway. Okay, well, uh, yeah, concrete. Well, I, I heard that at the intro, like about road and bridge and so on. And it, to me, it's the, it, it, the water pools in the asphalt. I don't know if I'm not just just not speaking road and bridge language right now, uh, but wanted to be clear that uh, I felt like the, the puddle forms in the asphalt. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hosting this. Thanks for being here. Um, looks like we have Jason up next. Um, and then Joel, and then um, we're gonna we're out of time after that. We'll quickly address some of the comments in, that Deb has put in the chat, um, and then we'll need to wrap it up. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, 
Hi, this is Jason. I'm, I'm sorry, I just pulled myself off of uh, mute. And um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. I just saw the uh, notice about this in the Ken Carroll newsletter. So I was a bit too late to the game, but I wanted to just offer just a few comments. Um, like the last speaker, I've been living in the, uh, in the Valley for the last five years. And a few things that stood out to me, um, even first moving into to the neighborhood, um, were the traffic signals that are located at the Bradford Intermediate School and also the, the, the horse crossing, I'll call it, um, that's, that's the connection um, as you're going over towards the trail up to the North Ranch. And um, in, my, um, in my past life as a, as a traffic engineer, there, I know of some other technologies that are now available, um, including a, a, a high intensity pedestrian activated crosswalk, which might be, in my opinion, a more suitable application in those locations, in part because the traffic signal just runs, you know, continuously until it's activated by a pedestrian wanting to cross there. Whereas um, with some of the newer technologies, it could still be visible as a, as a crosswalk with proper signage and, and indications to yield to pedestrians, but with um, with that, with the activated crosswalk, it could provide the proper you know, signaling to allow for a pedestrian to cross. And so if, if those are within the scope of a, you know, pave and overlay and milling project that, that you're taking on with Valley Parkway, I mean, those would, to me, would be appreciated improvements and ones would be more in line with the nature and, and context of, of Valley Parkway as a neighborhood uh, collector street as opposed to a, to a major thoroughfare. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. We, yeah, uh, no problem at all. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so we, that that was addressed at the start of the meeting under the outside of the scope. So um, ultimately, we would we would remove the signals once they become at once they reach a level where they're no longer um, say like structurally sound. Um, so oftentimes we remove signals if it's hit by a vehicle and the the mass arm is no longer acceptable. Um, we will not be going through and just removing this based off of an aesthetic reason um, at the time that it is removed based on condition of the actual signal itself then at that point we would go through the process of uh, collecting additional pedestrian data to determine um, what would be warranted at that crossing or either one of those crossing locations um, so uh, we would go through the warrant process to determine whether or not a re rectangular rapid flashing beacons could be installed um, but that would happen post the lifetime, the life frame of, of the signal itself. And we agree with you, Jason. Um, typically in this type of, of scenario, um, you know, the pedestrian actuated uh, flashers are, are more appropriate anymore than um, overhead signals that used to be installed for pedestrian crossings. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think... Next uh, was Joel. Yeah, hi guys, uh, Joel Panko here. Hi, uh, thanks uh, for what both of you have done for the community in, in years past and what, what you're doing for us now. It's really appreciated. Uh, two quick questions, because I know we're running short on time. Uh, first of all, with the speed data that you conducted, I was wondering if you're willing to post that on your website. I'd like to compare that to the study that your department did a couple of years ago. It showed over two thirds of vehicles were actually exceeding, this, exceeding the speed limit. So I'm curious, you know, how that compares and if you actually did a week long study again or whether this was perhaps a shorter study that maybe didn't capture, you know, um, the data like it did last time. And uh, secondly, I was wondering um, from a community standpoint, I remember you mentioned that uh, you do have some limited funding for some of these improvements. And I'm wondering if as you did for the uh, beacon that we arranged with your department for uh, West Ken Carroll Avenue and Valley Road, uh, if there'd be an opportunity, if you don't have some funding for perhaps some sort of cost sharing uh, arrangements, I, I think you have some sort of policy that you will allow for communities to, um, you know, engage in, in, in some sort of arrangement where we can actually, you know, pay to have an improvement done if, if you don't necessarily have the funding for that, or perhaps it scores lower on your list. That's what I had. Thank you. Um, I'll take this one. Uh, so those are good questions and it, it's a little tricky. Um, so the direct, 
the easy answer for some things is neighborhoods can do get a construction in the right of way permit um, to install facilities in public right of way. Um, and but the, the catch with those is they do need to still be warranted. So you can't just install something that, you know, the county says we go through warrants and it's not warranted that then the neighborhood can't say, well, we think it is. And then we want to install it. The county would not be improving that right away permit. So if it's a matter of funding and it's already something that, you know, it's on our lists and the neighborhood wants to go in and get it done sooner under their own costs, then they, the county can work with neighborhoods on construction right away permit. Um, in those cases, typically then the county um, takes over maintenance of those facilities. And, you know, so there's the one time cost to the community and then the county takes on the cost after that. There's other options that are um, licenses that you can have in the right of way to install facilities and then maintain a license. And those are OK, but the, the downside to those agreements are that um, the county can remove those the, those assets at any time for any reason. Um, and it's on the neighborhood to maintain them. and um, so it's it's not a very secure agreement for a neighborhood um, because it's right away the county has to maintain a lot of control over what's in there um, for safety reasons primarily. Um, so in regards to the flasher, um, we've you know that the board the HOA board has approved um, the funding for the the RFB at Ken Carroll and Valley Parkway. We also have um, a a signal pole there that we are planning on replacing um, in the next five years. And so we, that project's on hold just slightly, at least from our perspective, because we might need to be doing more at that intersection. So we're also looking um, at maybe coordinating those projects because there's cost savings um, when you have people mobilized, you have the contractors mobilized out there. There's less impact to, to residents as well when you have you know, fewer days of traffic control. Um, and now that we know about the CDOT project, uh, there's already going to be a bit of time of some interruption to traffic um, at the intersection of C470 and Ken Carroll. <laughs> and yes, we can certainly send you um, the data. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that, that we did conduct a full five days. So how we generally look at our, our transportation data in general um, is we try to get a Tuesday through Thursday period because lots of folks have, you know, days off on Mondays and Fridays. You know, we at the county were closed on Fridays, so lots of people don't work on Fridays. So we try to get those midweek counts. Um, and then because of the the concern over speeding, we wanted to ensure that we got weekend counts as well. So we did get a full five days of counts um, to to really get a, a solid understanding of the existing conditions. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so going through the chat here, um, I'm I'm not going to read it loud. Most that are mostly statements. We will we will as staff will we'll go through these statements and make sure that they're incorporated into our consideration. So I'm going to mostly look for questions in here. Um, why was no? Oh, hello. Uh, I was wondering, are you going to take any comments from people on audio only? Oh, uh, sure. I mean, I'm not trying to interrupt you. I just was wanting to see if I could get in the queue. But I know you're past your quick time anyhow, so I respect that. No worries. Please share your comments. Okay. Um, my name's Dave. I uh, lived in the Valley for 26 years. Um, and I've looked at uh, some of the comments from your meeting you had in July, and I wanted to respond a little bit to that. First off, I want to say I'm not trying to dispute other people's feelings and their observations. Um, I've been very surprised about the comments about speeding. Uh, in 26 years, I really rarely see anybody going on Valley Parkway um, very much over the speed limit. <clears throat> so I just wanted to add that to the mix of information that you've got to, do, to uh, uh, consider. Uh, likewise on stop signs, I, I must be in the wrong part of the valley because I rarely see anyone, uh, motorists anyhow, running stop signs. I see bicyclists doing it perpetually. Um, but I just wanted to add that. And uh, there's a comment made back 
in July about uh, possibly adding bike lanes to Valley Parkway, and I would say this about that. My observation is that I think, for the most part, the bicyclists and the motorists get along just fine on Valley Parkway. And if you're to add a bike lane, to me, I'm not the traffic engineer, you people are, um, I think you're going to constrict the motor vehicle lane so much that the left corner of all of our vehicles are going to be perilously close to the uh, yellow center line um, if we're, in fact, honoring the bike lane. So, anyhow, that's all I have to add, and uh, uh, thanks for having this forum. Thank you for your comments. Um, so, um, the traffic data closer to the school, we are going to be collecting more traffic data, um, in that, in that area. Uh, we did collect some, and as Christina mentioned, it just, um, it, the numbers looked off. So we're going to recollect them because we, sometimes when you do traffic data, sometimes our devices get blocked. Some things happen and we occasionally have to recollect data. Um, basically, we were based only showing traffic in one direction and we know there's traffic in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I think the part of the question she was regarding why we didn't collect um, data closer to Ken Carroll um, near the school. So uh, we determined our locations based off of where uh, the comments that we received in the interactive engagement map stated that they had concerns over speeding. So that's where we conducted speed studies. Um, but as Elena said, we will be conducting greater traffic data to understand our volumes um, and turning movements and things of that nature. But the the locations that we determined based off of con conducting the speed data were based off of the feedback that we received from the community. Um. And then there's a comment here on, um, has any consideration been given to reducing Valley Parkway to one lane with shoulders and a bike lane? Um, that's certainly an option um, potentially, to, you know, we'll have to measure some widths and stuff that can be potentially accommodated with paint. Um, but as the last element, I believe his name was Dave, had mentioned, you know, we would be considering making sure there is in fact enough room to accommodate bicycles and vehicles safely um, so more on that at the next meeting, um, if that is, is it seems there is comments on that's an option that residents would like to explore. And okay, sorry, bear with us while we're just, we're scanning through comments, looking for more questions versus again comments will be recorded statements will be recorded and we'll take that into consideration just wanted to answer questions so there is a question about stop signs um and why we don't install a four-way stop where there's potentially children crossing or near a school um, because while people may run through them or roll through them, they're at least slowing down. And there's an important role for a stop sign and it is to dictate who has right of way at an intersection. Stop signs are not meant for traffic calming. There are better solutions for traffic calming. Um, Unfortunately, the county doesn't have a very big toolbox of those solutions. Again, you know, we're trying to work on that and changing that, but there's also not a lot of money for those types of solutions at the county. Um, so we can install stop signs based on pedestrian warrants. Um, if there's enough pedestrians warranting that there's stop signs, but we don't want to install a stop sign telling motorists what to expect. And then that expectation is never met. And so when that happens, we get un, we get we have unwarranted stop signs and we have low compliance at stop signs when we have unwarranted stop signs. So the better what we look like at in some neighborhoods is where we have 
crossing volumes at an intersection that's only a two-way stop, we can do enhanced crossings without a stop sign to make that crossing that's uncontrolled more visible to motorists, which is more in line with expectations. So that is something where as soon as we finish collecting our data, that might be some suggestions at some of these intersections. Um, Christina, if you're scrolling ahead of me as I'm answering, jump in. Absolutely. Um, I do not see any more questions. Um, okay, and then there's one more hand up, and then I think there's that. I think or is that, that a legacy those, hand that was up? I think uh, it's a legacy hand. That would probably be me. Who's me? And up, uh, my name is John <laughs> Foschel. Okay. I uh, I am resident uh, living at the corner of the Valley Parkway and Barbary, which is directly across from uh, Bradford North uh, from the bus loop. And my point is about the bus loop, uh, which uh, <clears throat> the traditionally the the school or the school district has closed after school hours so that there is no uh, traffic going into and out of the, the bus loop. Just in the last year or so, the school and the school district, either one, has uh, changed that policy and the gates are now open on the bus loop. So during rush hour, 4 to 5 p.m., when we have activities across the street, a um, bicycle racing team and a football team there uh, with ensuing traffic. Uh, those lanes are open to come into and out of the Valley Parkway. And I'm wondering, uh, people are actually parking there on the Valley Parkway uh, because of that. Uh, and I'm wondering if it would be possible to install a couple more par no parking signs along the Valley Parkway directly adjacent to the entrance and outlet of the bus loop for the school because people <clears throat> people are going to uh, those activities between during the rush hours of 3 to 5 p.m. and uh, it would be nice to tell them they're not supposed to be parking on the Valley Parkway because I've seen them back up traffic four or five cars uh, on that fairly narrow, narrow road because of that. Christina, did you get all of that? I was trying to follow think, along on my map and. Yeah, I'm following along as well. Um, so I believe I got it. So as for the, the gates, if those are open, that's um, a concern that needs to be directed directly to the school district. Um, if that's been a historical operation of theirs, um, and that's and that's resulting in concerns, um, on street parking in this location, um, it's definitely. Let me just quickly measure to see if it doesn't look like it's accommodated. But let me make sure. Yeah, yeah. so there's definitely not uh, the ability to accommodate on street parking at this location. So um, it, it seems a little surprising to, to that people would do that because they'd be clearly pretty clearly blocking the lane. Um, yes. I would request uh, personally when this happens, if you wouldn't mind taking pictures and showing us exactly where this location is happening and how often it's happening so that we can try to take a deeper dive into this location itself. Um, that would be extremely helpful and you can email photos directly to me. Um, I deal with parking concerns here at the county. So um, uh, and obviously in con consultation with my team, but uh, these these concerns make their way to me anyway. So if you want to, um, if you have photos that can help assist us in understanding the time and location, that would be extremely helpful. Okay, yes, it, it was extremely surprising to me. This is just something new <laughs> this uh, uh, last couple of months. And uh, it, uh, I was just thinking that a, a simple no parking sign, especially at the outlet, of the bus loop, which is where the people park when there's no no more spots available on the bus loop, uh, that a simple additional sign there would probably help quite a bit. 
So I will uh, attempt to get photos and send them to you. Please, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I think, I think there's everybody. one more question about clarifying U-turns, um, the oh. U-turn right of way at White Oak. Um, so, Yelena, I'll let you speak to this. This this actually did come through um, more recently in emails, a couple of concerns about U-turns being completed. Um, Matt, if, you, if you're available to clarify if it's on the side oak access or if it's on the north white oak access at Club Drive or if it's at the south access. South. Okay, Perfect. so um, in general, U-turns in intersections are legal um, and right away would be determined based on uh, the traffic control device, the stop sign. So if um, the white oak, so that would mean that, um, you know, the the, the U-turn on Valley, if I'm in the right spot, would, would have the right It's the north employee. intersection, Yelena. So, oh. um, I mean, in the south intersection, which is the intersection that is not stop controlled, I believe. Correct. That's well, white oak is stop controlled, correct? Uh, white oak on the north entrance. White oak on the south is not. White Oak Drive, is, it should be kind of a, a circle. <laughs> White Oak does have a stop sign as mm -hmm. you are heading, I guess, what is it? Northeast to Valley. The stop right. sign is, is more an option than a suggestion. And that's why the, the people right around this intersection are very concerned. The speed between White Oak and Club down to White Oak South which is a curve, there is a hill, the speed is excessive. And I mentioned earlier that you conducted the study one month after the neighborhood was quite active on Nextdoor and other social media platforms complaining about speed, it has slowed down. The problem is at the White Oak South intersection, in addition to all the school buses, all the walkers, all the kids, the kids from the grade school that go on field trips and walk across, there is a U-turn that the people that are from Mountain Pine, a little bit north of Valley Parkway, they are forced to come up and make a U-turn with people speeding south on Valley Parkway. We've seen accidents multiple times. We've seen near misses multiple times. And that's the point that we've been trying to make. And I think that's what, what Matt's trying to ask the same thing. There's, there's no signage whatsoever. It's just, you know, turn and hope you make it. To do, to do the U-turn. There's no control at all. None. At that. And it's a half mile, you know, basically racetrack is what it amounts to. Um, okay, so there is a stop sign, which is a traffic control device. So that is dictating who has right of way at that intersection, that T intersection. In regard to no, like to U-turn signs, um, the way they are posted is basically when they're prohibited um, is is when we post no U-turns. Otherwise, at an intersection, U-turns are legal and it follows the, the right of way and the traffic control at that intersection. So basically, if your U-turn is like a left turn, then you're gonna be yielding to oncoming traffic. Anybody waiting at a stop sign yields to the, the main line. If I, if I may, I could clarify a little bit of that. So the residents coming out of Winterbrook, it's the opposite question and the opposite U-turn. They do it so regularly, it's their only way to exit the valley except to go out Club Drive. And so they just get in the habit that I'm doing this and I know I have the right of way and they don't uh, happen to notice if there might be a pedestrian already in the intersection, or if there might be a vehicle that has entered the intersection from the White Oak stop sign first. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Okay, that's the point. It's a habitual thing where they assume that, you know, they have the right of way no matter what comers are there, and often people are already in the intersection. Okay, so this is a location I believe that we are gonna be collecting 
um, some additional data um, for pedestrians and seeing what the movements look like at this intersection. Um, it's gonna, the habitual problem won't be solved by saying no U-turns. Um, that sign will be ignored um, because it's, it's the convenient way for circulation to happen for those folks who are doing it habitually. Um, so that behavior will typically continue unless there's some sort of um, geometric or vertical change um, where turning, turning movements are restricted. And I don't think anybody in white, I, you don't want your turning movements restricted either coming out of White Oak Drive. Um, so we'll, as far as pedestrians are concerned, you know, we can take a look at traffic and see, you know, predominantly, you know, which direction new turns are happening. You know, if there's enough pedestrians crossing here for some reason, I'm struggling a little to see why, since there's not a sidewalk on the other side of the street. Um, like what's it's, the draw? The kids walk on that green space constantly. So the, our point is that, you know, you're saying that there's no mitigation possible, but the stop sign is at least going to help, you know, putting a stop north, south, as well as on a white oak. So people will have to slow down at least and, and take a look at what's going on. That's kind of the case we're trying to make, especially with the kids running around there and everybody else. It's a very busy intersection. Okay. And like I said, we're, we'll be collecting, we're collecting the approach counts. Um, to find out, you know, what the warrants look like and looking and seeing what the pedestrian counts look like to see if it meets the warrants for an always stop. Like I said earlier, we will not be installing stop signs for traffic calming for the only to slow people down. That is not the purpose of that device. So I think I asked earlier and I know I put a lot of comments in. What do you have as potential solutions for traffic calming? Understanding budget constraints, understanding you don't have a lot in your toolbox. What I'm hearing is nothing. That is unincorporated Jefferson County. <laughs> well, this is not a city, so we don't have a lot of solutions and, and money for things. Um, so I would suggest, you know, if you want more traffic calming um, and you want that toolbox and, um, you know, let your elected officials know that that's a desire of the neighborhood. Um, you know, and typically when it's and new policies are being put out there, it's it's staff are typically directed to look at new policies. Um, it's our job to administer policies to the best of our ability, um, but we aren't typically the ones initiating new policies. Um, that that's that's generally initiated by residents through you know the political process. Um, the only other thing I'll say on that note is, um, because the, the comment was, the concern was over, um, when we decided to collect this data, post a, a next door post. Um, I think that highlights that this is really an educational concern. Um, it's important that we notify our neighbor that this is a concern in our residential area. Um, and if a next door or post actual component that, your neighbors needed to consider reducing their speed, that's a huge win for us. Um, we find that as a, a huge component of what um, of what traffic calming can be, right? right? A lot, lot of this thing are having these concerns. And once that awareness is brought to their attention, then they start to change their behaviors. Um, there was a question that came through about a yield sign going to be added. Um, great question mark. So depending on the roadway design, if this maintains to uh, Two lanes to merge um, at the time of overlay when we go in and do this, we will clean up any signage that needs to change or um, any signage that needs to be added. Mm, yeah, I do see what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that to attention. But like I said, we will absolutely, um, we look at all of our signage when we're when we're in, a, in on these projects. So um, anything that might be needs to be removed based off of a change um, in roadway design. And if that maintains, then um, that's our opportunity to go in and put in that signage. Uh, Joel, yes, um, your county commissioners are your elected officials at the county. Great, well, um, Thank you, everyone, since we've we've gone a little bit over, um, which is absolutely fine. We're happy to address all your comments and concerns. 
Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, we've mentioned a couple of times since, uh, we will be collecting the additional data that we're still looking to determine what design solutions we can potentially implement. Um, so once we have the rest of that data compiled, we'll start creating a couple design solutions. At that time, we'll schedule another meeting through Victoria to, um, to get the word out on what those solutions might look like and get some additional feedback from the group. Um, so on that note, again, thank you all so much and, um, and we look forward to collaborating again in the future. Okay, thank you. Have a great evening, thank everyone. Thank you.